Greetings, folks. Welcome to another one of our Friday community classes here on the Green Art Channel. This week, I'm excited to do a little bit of a deep dig into one of my favorite topics and something that I get asked about all the time, which is what is the plant spirit path that I so often speak of and what does it look like as a spiritual practice? I almost titled this class wandering the way of the herb wise as a spiritual practice in the modern day. But I got to thinking about it and I realized that even though so much of what we're doing is happening in a modern context, I mean, I'm speaking to you over the interwebs right now, which is pretty wild if you think about it, not very much has changed. You know, the spirit part of the plant spirit path remains exactly what it's always been. And so I think I would rather focus on the depth, the longevity, the green thread of this particular tradition uh, as it spans back across infinite time. So uh, here we will be talking about the plant spirit path, wandering the way of the herb wise as a spiritual practice. And this is a cool class because it's giving me the opportunity to talk about something that we don't hear people talk about very much in really any iteration of magic, sorcery, paganism, witchcraft, druidry, whatever, which is why bother? What's the point of it? What's the ultimate goal? Uh, while I don't have all the answers and I don't even necessarily think that there is one unified goal, one unified place where we're all trying to get, I think that asking why we do what we do and understanding how we get from point A to point B of the why is worth our time and it's valuable. So let's get into it. Here's a little overview of where we will be going in this class. First, we're going to start out with the definition of the plant spirit path. What is it? What does it mean? Uh, of course, these definitions are my own. They're limited to my personal experiences and perspectives. They may, may not speak for other people. Uh, they're not meant to speak for other people, but I think a definition is really important in this work. We're going to look at becoming herb wise. What does that mean uh, in my practice? What does what is it uh, referring to when I speak about the herb wise folk? We'll talk about wandering the maze, which is really the journey, right? The spiritual journey of walking a plant spirit path. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it mean? And where does it take us? Then we will explore some practices and practicalities of the path. You know, there are so many ways to approach this, but there are essentials, in my opinion, and things that, as simple as they may look on paper, have a deceptive depth, right? They uh, go deeper and further into the mysteries than we might ever imagine. Tending to the inner garden is really where I want to focus on the benefits of this work. Again, why? What's in it for us, right? Because there are so many things in it for us. And we will end with a little chat on living in a world full of magic. So let's get started. The plant spirit path. First of all, in order for us to talk about walking a plant spirit path, working with plant spirits, engaging uh, with plant spirit medicine, plant spirit magic, we have to dissect this concept of plant spirit, right? And there's two words here uh, with their own individual meanings and their own power, but we choose to put them together and sort of express them as one unified idea. The first word, of course, is plant because we're talking about plants. Uh, I use that word very loosely. When I say plant, I mean plants, trees, lichen, fungus, mushrooms, uh, you know, all of our all of our friends. Uh, we use the word plant as a very broad spectrum kind of term. Uh, and then spirit. And this is where I see people use this term without really having much of an actual understanding of what plant spirit work is. In order for us to do plant spirit work, we have to acknowledge and experience that plants have spirit and beyond plants being in possession of spirit acknowledging and experiencing that plants are spirit that like you and i like your pet cat your pet dog like the birds in the trees they are individual sovereign and conscious beings now 
this concept of having spirit uh, can be very tricky and very nuanced. I have other classes on this, but it is the foundation of the world's oldest nature-based spiritual tradition, which is animism, right? Animism takes many forms, many expressions, and it's more of a perspective and an experience of the world than it is a particular practice or tradition, but we definitely see it everywhere all the time. And in order for us to do the kinds of work that we do on the plant spirit path, we have to be willing to engage with plants as persons, which is what animism is all about, right? Uh, one of my favorite uh, teachers, Graham Harvey, has succinctly defined animism as uh, living in a world filled with persons, only some of those persons being human, right? That plants like us are conscious, aware, full of wisdom, and engaged in the world. Uh, they are radically different kinds of people than us, and this is where uh, we would go out into the weeds in this class, so I'm going to save it for another time or other classes I've already done, but they are persons nonetheless. And one really cool uh, sort of meditative practice that you can do, you could pause this right now and try it and see where it takes you, or you can save it for later, is to really contemplate and meditate on what is a person? What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to have personhood, right? And generally, it's quite easy for us to say, well, a person is a human being, and we generally call humans persons, and everyone else not a person. But what you will find is that you can very easily apply all of the things that mean personhood to you to animals, right? And then it becomes easier to apply those things and experience them in plants and then in natural, you know, in spirited features. Again, a little beyond the scope of this class, but very important. If plants aren't persons, uh, there's no path for us to walk with them. Yeah. Verdant tutelage is a very important part of the plant spirit path. It basically means that our goal is to learn directly from the plants, to be mentored by them. Plants are, and you will hear me say this an annoying amount of times, plants are the greatest authority on plants, right? They know more about themselves than we ever will. So when we want to learn about the magic of plants, their stories, their medicine, their botany, the way they show up in the world, their mysteries, there is no greater teacher than the plants themselves. And a big part of the plant spirit path is learning how to learn from the plants, right? We have so many great books, classes, workshops, different things you can do uh, that will put you into direct encounter with plant spirits. But ultimately, the greatest gift you can give yourself is to learn how to learn directly from the plants. So verdant tutelage is very, very crucial in this work. Um, we work with the plants in the same way that people in other kinds of traditions work with saints or uh, heroes or some of the deities, right? We approach the plants and work with them. Connection to the mysteries, a big part of the plant spirit path as I practice it is acknowledging that the plants are ultimately rooted in otherness, that there is uh, on the physical level, there is a part of the plants known as the roots that dig down into the darkness, into the unseen, into the realms below, into the realms of otherness. And that is symbolic of the fact that as spiritual beings, as arcane spirits, the plants are rooted in the other world, in otherness. You might call this other world uh, the land of fairy. You might call it Tirnanog. You might call it Avalon. Whatever you call the spirit world, whatever you call it, the plants come from there. And while they are fully invested in our side of the world, right? You can look out a window right now and see plants existing in our world right alongside of us there is a part of them that is equally invested in otherness. As half the tree grows upwards into our world, the other half, the root system, grows downward into the other world. So they are truly liminal beings who have one foot in two worlds. So when we work with plants, 
We engage with them as they choose to show up in our world with the colors and patterns and uh, fragrances and tastes and magic and medicine and stories that they carry on our side of the hedge. But we are also connected to them in the other world and they end up teaching us something about this other world, right? So this is a very important part of the plant spirit path. Uh, People assume that we only want to engage with the plants in their physicality as they show up here. And even if you do that, uh, you will end up getting, you know, revelation and green gnosis about otherness, which is very cool. And another big part of this is uh, the cultivation of allies that we, through our work over years and decades, uh, we nourish very special and sacred relationships with individual plants that sort of become our closest uh, allies, right? They become our uh, part of our hearth culture, but we simultaneously become connected with all plants through our connection with some plants. And this is because all plants are connected, right? They're all drawing their power from the same well. And for those on a plant spirit path, uh, we get to walk out into the world and experience being surrounded by allies, being surrounded by conscious, perceptive, communicative beings who are radically different than us, but are still fully aware of us, right? They see us uh, and they see us from their own perspective, but they see us nonetheless. And we will come back to this in a, in a later slide here, but uh, this invites us back to living in a world filled with magic. And in my opinion, that blessing in and of itself is worth whatever work and effort we might put into walking this path. So let's move on. Becoming herbwise. This is uh, something that I say is a little bit of a shorthand to why we do this work. What's the goal, right? So the reason that we do this work is to become herbwise, to know something about the herbs. And that knowledge is multifaceted. Part of it is book knowledge, right? It's learning about botany and growing patterns and how plants are grown and their histories and how they got to where they are. Part of it is studying folklore and understanding charms and magical applications and stories and the ways that plants show up in various bits of mythology. Uh, Part of it is medicinal, right? Exploring the ways that herbalists have worked with particular plants uh, over the ages. But then we drop from knowledge into a state of wisdom where all of the knowledge that we have combines with our direct experience of the plants, that verdant tutelage, right? And it becomes wisdom. And when the plants start blessing us with this wisdom, with this direct gnosis, this direct aha, right? From the green realm, we are on the path of the herb wise. Uh, we are becoming people who are like the plants, rooted fully in the world that we live in, but having some access to the other world, the world of the plants, which is quite magical and quite powerful. Uh, We do this work because we want to be wisdom keepers. We want to preserve the stories that have been left to us by our herbwise ancestors. And we also want to preserve our stories, the ones the plants tell us now. And part of keeping this wisdom is part of being herbwise, right? All herbwise people are innately teachers and wisdom keepers and storytellers because the plants tell us stories and we get excited to tell those stories to other people, right? So that's how it works. It's uh, we recruit and we proselytize. Uh, becoming herbwise means having an understanding of plant virtues of the way that they show up in magic, in the transformation of pattern and energy, and of medicine, the way that they can create harmonious change within the human being on all the levels. And greater than that is the herbwise understanding that magic and medicine, when approached through spiritual herbalism, through working with the plants as spirits, are the exact same thing. That uh, the plants do not differentiate what is a magical transformation and what is a medicinal transformation in the same way we do. They just show up with all of their virtues, with all of their blessings and all of their wisdom and all of their power and influence in the world and do what they do. We, of course, uh, 
break that down. And we write about some of it in books on herb magic, and we write about some of it in books on herbal medicine. But from their perspective, there's no difference. Their powers are their powers, their virtues are their virtues. And uh, this contemplation of the unity of magic and medicine through herbal work, right, uh, also reminds us that plants are not here to serve the exceptional human narrative, right? They're not tools for us. They are not resources that are here just for us to tap, that they are uh, sovereign beings living their own life, having their own experience, and they are so gracious and generous. Uh, In fact, they are really bastions of generosity uh, to share everything they do with us. But we talk about them having virtues and blessings rather than saying, what are they good for? What can they do for me, right? Um, None of us like to be spoken of that way. None of us like to be reduced to uh, what we're good for, you know, or how we can be of service to somebody else. We like to be seen as a whole person and so do the plants. Again, we end this slide with this concept of being surrounded by allies, right? A big part of the work of becoming herbwise focuses on living in a world where we are in the direct presence of our spiritual teachers, of our uh, teachers and initiators and mentors from the other realm. We don't have to imagine them. We don't have to enshrine them because they exist here in a very physical and very powerful form. So let's move on. Wandering the maze, I like to call it, and I love to use these old Troy Town mazes as a symbol for the deep forests, the primordial forest uh, around us, but also of the forest within, you know, navigating uh, our wild internal landscapes that we all have. So one thing about the plant spirit path that can be very frustrating to people, and 25 plus years in, it still frustrates the hell out of me sometimes, is that the process is the path. There is no destination. There is no end, right? Uh, Just like when we're wandering the forest, uh, we navigate an experience and every step on that experience brings us deeper into the wildness and deeper into ourselves. And there's not really this concept of getting to the end, right? We may come back to where we started only to go again, experiencing it in a deeper and more profound way than we did the first time. Uh, But the journey, the studying, the experiencing, the trial and error, the wins, the losses, all of the things that we do are the path, right? They are the journey. And that is very important for us to remember. Uh, The plants exemplify this concept of cyclicality, of seasons, right? Of things uh, going in this rotational nature rather than this linear nature that we're so accustomed to and conditioned to. The plants say, oh, everything and everywhere you've been and done, you will come back to again. Spring will come again, but you can dig into the mysteries of spring a little deeper each time, right? It's like a spiraling down. Peeling onions, you know, as we go further Uh, into the path, we go further into ourselves. What is novel and new now becomes our new normal and we do the work and suddenly we realize how deeply we've gone, right? So this is very important. And I think also about the symbolism of tree rings, which these old Troy Town mazes remind me of when I look at them, Uh, they remind me of a, you know, a cross section of an old tree where you can go through and survey the years of growth the things that have happened, the hard years, the good years, and realize where you've been and what you've experienced and how every bit of study, every bit of healing you've received from the plants, every plant spirit journey, every plant you've stewarded in your garden and uh, been excited to identify in the wild has added a ring to your own internal tree, your own map of where you've been. And so we say the path is very much a wandering path rather than a straight and narrow path, right? Because uh, it is, right? Again, it goes in these circles and spirals sometimes, which we learn to love. So some practices and practicalities. 
First, we always want to seek the blessings of our ancestors and specifically our herbwise ancestors, those folks who came before us, who were engaged with the plants in the way that we are now, the wisdom keepers that are uh, part of our family line. And even if you've never heard of one, I guarantee you've got at least a few not too far back who knew the old lore, knew the charms, knew which herbs were capable of healing which diseases, uh, which plants needed to be harvested when, which plants could make someone sick, right? Uh, we have them in our each of our families. So to call out to those ancestors is very, very smart because they are always waiting to be plant-like. And as I mentioned earlier, plants are bastions of generosity and plant people are equally generous. They are always eager uh, to share, you know, and so your ancestors are there doing that. And we have, of course, uh, the collective of herbwise ancestors, all people from all places and all times who have ever been initiated into the dual citizenship of the herbwise, and they will bless us if we open. We think about uh, all of the teachers who have written books and left us wisdom and stories and folklore and trial and error over the ages. Uh, we can count them amongst our ancestors and uh, this type of work should be always part of the herbwise practices, the green, the green arts. Plant spirit journeys are, in my opinion, the most important practice for walking a plant spirit path. If we are not engaging with plant spirits, then what's the point, right? So a plant spirit journey can take many, many forms. Ultimately, it is, uh, in my definition, it is a period of time set aside for us to simply sit and invoke or evoke and reach out to the plant spirit through a variety of very powerful methods, uh, some of them internalized and some of them uh, more ritualized so that we can be in direct communion with them. We can uh, enter into an energetic rapport with them and that the wisdom can flow effortlessly between us. And I teach a lot of different methods of doing this. Some of them involve uh, receiving the medicine internally. Some of them involve gazing at the plant. Some of them involve uh, journey work or, or flight by spirit into the other world. There are all kinds of different ways to go about doing it, but we do it time and time again with all kinds of different plants, sometimes coming back to the same plant over and over again because we have a deep connection with them. And by journeying with the plants, we learn something about the plants that we're journeying with. We learn something about the plant spirits, all the allness of plant spirits. We learn something about the cosmos, the way the world and the universe are put together. And we also learn very important things about ourselves along the way, right? Which we will uh, talk about in the next slide. Engaging with immediacy is another really important part of this work. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s and all the way through till now, so many of the books that have been written on herbal magic and plant spirit work and herbal medicine have surveyed a variety of plants that exist from one side of the planet to the other. Uh, and while having that wisdom is so powerful, because again, when we learn about one plant, we learn about something of the spirit of all plants. Ultimately, the only plants that are relevant in our practice are the ones that grow where we grow, right? So uh, the best practice is to engage with the plants who share space with you now. You are already in communion with particular plants. There are plants and trees growing right outside your door that you pass every single day that bear witness to your cycles, your comings and goings that pick up on things in your heart before you do. Uh, and these are the plants that we should be most engaged with, right? So when we engage with uh, immediacy, we step into a sacred relationship with the land that nourishes us and the sky that covers us. We come to know the plants that share space with us. We learn something about the animals and insects who share their spaces with us. And oftentimes, we also have these really beautiful experiences of persons of place, spirits of place, right? Uh, engaging with the non-physical beings who haunt the lands where we live. And suddenly, we're in this respectful, reciprocal uh, relationship with the whole of things by being in respectful relationship with our immediate 
way of things. And this is animism. And this is uh, nature-based spiritual practice, right? It's just engaging with where you are. Also, you know, I will say as a sidebar, when people are engaged with the land this way, when they know the trees and plants that grow around them, when they know about the animals and the birds and the insects, when they know about the comings and goings of their human communities, uh, it becomes very hard for us to make decisions that are harmful to those spaces, right? Because we know them by name, we feel seen by them, we participate in them, we experience finally our part of this, and it becomes very hard to hurt someone you love, right? So uh, this is, in my opinion, really the only effective form of, uh, you know, ecological spirituality is just being in relationship enough that you love where you are and all of the denizens of that place. And last but not least in practices and practicalities is being a catalyst, right? That we try to embody the teachings of the plants and share those with the world to create more harmony. Plants are harmonizers. They, we see this in their magic. We see this in their medicine. We see this in their folklore. We see this in the balm plants, the healers. We see in the baneful plants, the poisoners. They are all going towards one goal, which is to establish uh, harmony wherever they are invited. And so when we work with plants, we slowly become these human catalyzers for harmony. And we find that uh, we can see in the world places where we want to invite the medicine of the plants to usher in and bring healing and bring magical transformation and bring their verdant blessings. And uh, this really, if I was to say there's one goal, this is the goal, right? We see this concept of the establishment of harmony as crucial to all of the Indo-European uh, pagan traditions from across, from India to Scotland, right? But we also see them hailing from older pre-Indo-European uh, streams of wisdom. So this is crucial, right? That humans have a role to play. We're important. We belong here. Uh, and that we can choose to show up in the world in the way that the plants do, which is as harmonizers, as bringers of blessings, right? As the plants have their plant blessings, we have our human blessings, right? One of those blessings, by the way, uh, is these cool opposable thumbs that we have, which allow us to make things and build things and clean things and write things, right? Which is pretty incredible. Tending to the inner garden. This is where we start doing the deep work, the personal work. Uh, we think about James Lovelock's Gaia theory, which I don't really think is a theory anymore. I feel like we've collectively sort of just accepted it as truth that each and every living entity on the planet is like a cell in the body of existence. And it is not possible that we can become healthier individuals without influencing the health of the whole. So there is always room in this work to be selfish. There's always room in this work to say, how can I be happier? How can I be healthier? How can I release this, release this pain that I've had or, uh, you know, have this thing that I've, that I want to have in life or this, this ability, um, the more harmonious we are as individuals, the more harmonious the whole body of things is. So this is an invitation to take care of yourself. Uh, tending to the inner garden is that process. And I call it this because we have many traditions of uh, working with an imaginal liminal space within that takes the form of a curated garden. The first uh, thing to consider here is the plant perspective, that plants can perceive our state of wellness in a much bigger way than we can, right? We know when we don't feel well, we know when we've broken something or when we're sick or when we are sad, uh, we know when we're out of sorts in a very personal kind of way. When we work with plants spiritually, they perceive our out of sortness, out of sortsness uh, in a more global or cosmic way. So, when we invite them into our healing, we don't just get skin deep healing uh, or internal healing. 
we are also given the opportunity to heal in the way that the plants perceive our healing, which is in this really big capital S spiritual kind of way. Uh, and so people find that even if they have worked with herbal medicine for many years and, you know, had really great healing success with herbal medicine or whatever the case is, they find that when they start doing plant spirit work, the healing takes on a different kind of sentiment. The depth uh, becomes different, the power becomes different, and the result becomes different because the plants are uh, being allowed to step in with their particular wisdom, right? Their particular perception, which is much greater than ours because, again, they're in two places at once, right? They can see the uh, manifest side of us and they can see the spiritual root side of us and they can help us um, get to those places. Tending to the inner garden is also a reclamation and a rec uh, sort of a recognition of part of us, right? That we are part of all of this, that we belong here, that everything we do matters, that everything we um, contribute to this world does create change, that how we show up means something, right? It can be very easy for us to feel disheartened to feel like nothing we do matters that the you know we're sort of just being swept up in the stream of things uh, but the plants constantly teach us that it takes a collaboration of trees to create a forest and the behavior of every single one of us what we hold uh, nudges the whole further and further into states of harmony or further and further into states of chaos right kind of uh, depends on how we choose our adventure and at the end of the day and some you know sometimes the most interesting but also the least fun part of this work is that the plants will always encourage us to work on our shit uh, they will always say hey you have this thing you've been ignoring or you have this dark space within you that deserves light and warmth or as we peel the onion of our wellness we get deeper and deeper into things and they want us to get better, right? They want us to be the best version of ourselves that we can. They want us to show up as our full potential. You know, the plants will always ask us to be the most beautiful we can be, right? This is a very, very big ask from them, but they simultaneously ask us to do it and also support us in doing it. So again, when we are working on the chronic headache or the anxiety or the the whatever the thing is that we're working on we find that the 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 plants will gently gently just point in the direction of the root of things and sometimes we're conscious of it and sometimes we're not and it doesn't matter either way uh, they will start finding those spaces that have become crystallized and frozen and solid and really dug into pattern and they will start softening them. And so as we are healing this seemingly physical pattern, suddenly the world that we live in begins to change. Our experiences change. We start to change as we get deeper into the roots of things. And it's quite a magical process. Speaking of magic, all of this leads to living in a world full of magic. A lot of us had some time when we were kids, when we lived in a magical world. We stepped out into a world where we had more questions than answers, where we had this understanding that anything was possible. And we also had an understanding that as we perceived the world of nature, nature perceived us back, that we were being looked back upon, right? And a lot of people who get drawn to the plant spirit path also, you know, had experiences when they were younger with maybe seeing or having experiences with non-human persons, with the fairy, with the ancestors, with plant spirits, uh, with animal spirits, whatever. Uh, a lot of us just lived more magically. We just sort of experience the world in this more magical place. And of course, as we age and we let the conditioning of uh, the world come in, it uh, breaks that part of us down, you know, it calluses it, but it's still in there. And so when we do plant spirit work, it becomes impossible not to step out into the world, even if you're just walking from your front door to your car, 
becomes impossible not to walk out into the world and feel seen, feel like the world is looking back at you, to experience a little magic, to give a nod to the trees that you now know their names, uh, to be excited to see the return of the plants at certain times of year or the fading at certain times of year, to see the plants uh, interacting with different animals and insects, to see uh, the way that the world around you is alive and complicated and that it is an infinite web made up of countless relationships of which you are one, right? And so it changes things. And when we start being able to perceive the interconnectedness of all things, that the world is filled with magic in this way, because we can perceive it, it becomes easy for us to engage with it and to take those threads that maybe are linking to something that we're not happy about or that we want to change or something that we love and want to nourish and to pluck those, bong bong, right? And just say, this I want to work on. This I perceive in a different way now. In other words, our intuition, right, gets, gets honed and sharpened. So uh, if nothing else, we engage with the plants this way, so that when we walk out into the world, we are surrounded by allies and magic and medicine and the company uh, of a universe that looks back on us, right? Which is pretty cool. Uh, especially now, you know, where one of the biggest concerns of mental health in, in I don't know if it's global or mostly in America or the West uh, is loneliness, right? People feeling so disconnected and so cut off because we've been conditioned that's we're easier to control when we're alone right so step back in uh to there being strength in numbers step back into the collective of your community which is all the humans around you but also so much more than that especially the plants so with that thank you so much for sitting through over a half an hour of discussion on the plant spirit path uh, I do post free classes every single Friday right here on the YouTube. If you haven't subscribed, please do that. I would also love to have you leave a comment below. Let me know what you thought, what you liked, uh, what this made you think about, what it reminds you of. Uh, we have a very active Patreon community where you can get access to all of my content every month, which includes Plant Spirit Journeys monthly. Uh, and a huge library and archive of past plant spirit journeys you can go through and learn how to do and take on your own time. Uh, we have our rotating courses, advanced classes and workshops, and all kinds of other really cool stuff, including very cool people hanging out. Uh, I've written two books, Spiritual Herbalism and The Green Art. Both of them are published by Aeon in London. You can get them worldwide. Please buy my books. I think they're great. Uh, we do have the Spiritual Herbalism program online, which is a 40-hour uh, on-demand immersive course in the ways of spiritual herbalism as I practice it. And I do have a second YouTube channel called Hortus Viridios, which explores my work with the primordial uh, deity, the green man. So a little bit uh, more for you to go dig into. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. See you next time.